Shalom. I'm Eddie Chumney of Hebraic Heritage Ministries, and we welcome you to our study on the Hebraic Roots of Christianity. We need to remember that whenever we're studying the Hebraic Roots of Christianity, we must keep everything centered on Yeshua the Messiah. That is because in Psalm chapter 40, verse 7, it is written, Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. That verse is quoted of Yeshua in Hebrews in chapter 10 and verse 7. Then Yeshua himself stated in Luke chapter 24, verse 44, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the Torah of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms, concerning me. Therefore, Yeshua stated that the Hebrew scriptures are written of him, that the Torah is written of him. Therefore, in order to understand your Bible in its fullness, you need to see Yeshua in the Torah. You need to see how Yeshua in the Torah is connected and related to his first coming and his ministry as given in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and how then it is related to his second coming. So central in seeing Yeshua in the Torah is realizing that Yeshua gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. And once we realize that Yeshua is our Savior, and that He saves His people from their sins. We can determine from the New Testament that Yeshua gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. In Matthew, in chapter 1 and verse 21, it is written, And she, referring to Mary, shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name in Hebrew Yeshua which means salvation, for he shall save his people from their sins. And then in Luke chapter 2, in verse 11, it is written, For unto you was born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. So once you realize and can accept that Yeshua is, is our Savior, and that He saves His people from their sins. Now, we can look at James in chapter 4 and verse 12. In the first part of the verse says, There is one lawgiver who is able to save. The one that's able to save is the lawgiver, the one that gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. So, who is the one that is able to save? Well, Yeshua saves, and he is the lawgiver. In Isaiah, in chapter 33 and verse 22, the following is stated. The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. So it says here that the Lord saves us, and who is the one that saves us? It is Yeshua. And the one that saves us is our judge. We're told in Romans chapter 14, verse 10, we will all appear before the judgment seat of Messiah. And the one that saves us, that is our judge, is also our king. Yeshua is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Revelation chapter 19, verse 16. And the one that saves us is our king, is our judge, is our lawgiver, Yeshua gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. In John chapter 14 and verse 15, Yeshua said, If you love me, keep my commandments. When he stated these words, he was associating this to the very first place in the Bible where we see the phrase, Love me and keep my commandments. And it is found in the chapter on the giving of the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20, where there, the one that brought his people out of Egypt is the one that is speaking to Moses at Mount Sinai, and he says these words, that he shows mercy unto 
thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. See, mercy or grace is shown to those who love the lawgiver and seeks to keep his commandments. Yeshua said in John, in chapter 14 and verse 23, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now, in Ephesians, in chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, we are told that we are saved by grace through faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And given that we are saved by grace through faith, Paul then asks the question in Romans chapter 3, verse 31. Do we do away with following the Torah because we're saved by grace through faith? Romans chapter 3, verse 31. Do we make void the Torah through faith? And Paul answers the question, God forbid. No, we do not make void the Torah through faith. He goes on to say, we establish the Torah. You see... Christianity has been presented that you choose between Yeshua or following the Torah. That is an invalid choice. Yeshua is the one who saves us, but the way we express our faith in Him and the way that we show our love to Him is to keep His commandments or to follow His Torah. And then it's presented in Christianity, you must choose between following the Torah or the grace of God. But that is also an invalid choice because in Exodus chapter 20, verse 6, it says he shows mercy. He shows grace to those that love him and keep his commandments. And then in Psalm 103, verses 17 and 18, it is written, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, to such as keep his covenant and those that remember his commandments to do them. You see, the grace for the mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting. There's not a certain period of time that is an age of grace. Grace has always been because it's characteristic of the God of Israel himself. Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. And then the one who gave the Torah at Mount Sinai said of himself in Exodus in chapter 34 and verse 6, the Lord passed by before Moses and said, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. And so it's not in our own merit that we receive the righteousness of the God of Israel. Our righteousness is in Messiah. It's in his redemptive work. Second Corinthians in chapter 5 and verse 21, it is written, For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so we are saved by grace through faith, but after we're saved by grace through faith, we uphold and we keep the Torah. Now, in the first century, there was not an issue or a debate if you believed in the God of Israel, whether you followed his Torah or not. The debate was how you follow his Torah. And given that Yeshua gave the Torah at Mount Sinai, that he came and he gave the correct interpretation and understanding of how you follow the Torah. And in essence, Messiah taught that 
You express your love for the God of Israel with your heart. And you are to follow his Torah with the help of his spirit. Because without his spirit, man has a stony heart. And a man rebels against keeping the Torah of the God of Israel. He doesn't want to hear and he doesn't want to obey and follow with his heart. And so this is why Yeshua taught that the core essence of following the Torah is doing it with all your heart under the God of Israel. That's why the greatest commandment as Yeshua was asked and answered in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36, when he was asked, what is the great commandment of the Torah? He said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then he went on to say that the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. So following the Torah is applying the Torah through the perspective of love. Loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. So we are doing a series on Torah and the New Testament. And we are looking at various passages that is often quoted in traditional Christianity to make the claim that we are not supposed to follow the Torah. We've already looked at John chapter 1 verse 17, Matthew chapter 5 verses 17 and 18. We looked at Matthew in chapter 15. We looked at Peter's vision. And now we're looking at Acts chapter 15. And in particular, we are looking at the issue of circumcision and what is the dispute? What is the debate regarding circumcision? What does the Torah teach about circumcision? And how is the issue of circumcision, how does it play out in the New Testament? And the Torah requires there to be circumcision. In Genesis in chapter 17 and verses 9 through 13, the one who made covenant with Abraham, and that is Yeshua, as Paul explained in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. He's the seed that made covenant with Abraham. And that Abraham was instructed that those of his household and those who sojourn with him, the stranger, that when they are born in eight days old, they are to be circumcised. But then in Deuteronomy in chapter 10 and verse 12, the question is asked, Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? Verse 16, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. So the Torah requires circumcision. It requires physical circumcision. It requires circumcision of the heart. But there's a major Torah principle that we need to understand. And that is, while it is true that if you break any element and aspect of the Torah, which is a covenant, you have broken the entire covenant, as James explains in James chapter 2, verse 10, for whosoever shall keep the whole Torah but offend in one point is guilty of all. And then, as we can see in Romans in chapter 3 and verse... 23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that being the case, not all Torah commandments have equal weight because in Matthew in chapter 5 and verse 19, Matthew in chapter 5 in verse 
19. It says, Whoever therefore shall break one of the least commandments and shall teach men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever will do and teach them, the same will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And so not all commandments have equal weight. As we can see from Yeshua's statement in Matthew, in chapter 23, verse 23, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and he goes on to say at the end of the verse, which things you ought to have done, but then he says, you have omitted the weightier matters of the Torah, judgment, mercy, and faith. And so judgment, mercy, and faith carry more weight in the Torah than paying tithe of mint and anise and cumin. And so that being the case, once we understand this principle, then what has the greater weight to be circumcised in your heart, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16, or circumcised in your flesh? And of the two, which does the God of Israel require to establish you and put you in right relationship with the God of Israel. Because, you see, one of the issues in the first century is when the non-Jew came to faith in Yeshua as the Messiah, how is the non-Jew seen by the Jewish community as being a part of the covenant people, as being a part of those who are to follow the Torah that was given at Mount Sinai. And so, in the first century, we had the Pharisees and the scribes, and the biblical Pharisees, they are the ones who later wrote the Talmud. And the Talmud is regarded as the written down oral law that was taught. And today, those who follow the Talmud or the oral law, they don't call themselves Pharisees today. They call themselves Orthodox Jews. Sometimes the followers are referred to as Rabbinic Judaism, and sometimes it's shortened to just refer to as following Judaism. And so the... Pharisees taught that in order for a non-Jew to be accepted as a part of the Jewish community and to have covenant obligations, that they must first go through a physical circumcision to establish covenant relationship. And in Acts chapter 15, there is a dispute between Pharisaic believers in Yeshua as the Messiah. Acts chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go to Jerusalem under the apostles and the elders about this question. And then in verse 5 it says, But there arose certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that, that it was needful for them to circumcise the non-Jews and to keep the Torah of Moses. And so, circumcision was the event by the teachings of rabbinical Judaism, the Pharisees, the scribes of the first century, of how a non-Jew was to be accepted into the Jewish community and be seen as a part of the covenant People. So, therefore, being physically circumcised, which they regarded as a conversion, is synonymous with being a covenant people. And being a covenant people is associated with an obligation 
and a commitment to follow the Torah. So therefore, you had the link of circumcise them and to keep the Torah of Moses. And so this is not a debate about whether a non-Jew should follow the Torah. It was a bit debate about how they are accepted into the family and seen as part of the nation of Israel, the covenant people of Israel, the people that are in covenant relationship with the God of Israel, which when Yeshua died on the tree and he shed his blood, he brought in a new covenant, a covenant relationship. And so the Pharisees that followed the oral law, they had one perspective about coming in and being a part of that covenant relationship. But Yeshua has a people that receive him, and they also are regarded as being in covenant relationship with him. And so did he taught or did the Torah teach that in order to be a part of the covenant people, you needed to first be circumcised, which is what this sect of the Pharisees who believed were arguing. But Paul and Barnabas argued otherwise. So were they arguing that you're not supposed to follow the Torah? Is that what they were arguing? No. Paul said in Romans chapter 3, verse 31, do we make void the Torah through faith? We uphold the Torah. So Paul was giving his argument on this particular issue, and he is going to use a Torah argument. We know what Paul's perspective is on the matter because he explains it in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father has found pertaining to the flesh? If Abraham was justified by his own works, he has wherefore to glory, but not before God. So, Abraham in the Torah was not justified by his works. So, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So, is that just a New Testament doctrine? No. Regarding Abraham, it says in Romans chapter 4, verse 2, that Abraham was not justified by his works. But then he, it says in verse 3, what does the scripture say? Or what does the Torah say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So Paul is using a Torah argument, and it's Abraham's life, who he goes on to say in Romans chapter 4, verse 16, that he is the father of of our faith. And it says that Abraham is the father of us all. So looking at the father of our faith, in what way was he regarded as righteous before the God of Israel in the Torah? And it was because he believed in God with his heart. He trusted him, trusted in the promises of the God of Israel. And Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get you out of your country and from your kindred and from your father's house into a land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those that curse you. I will bless those that bless you and curse him that curses you. And on all you, you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abraham departed. So this was the instruction that the God of Israel gave to him. Abraham obeyed. He departed. And so in his obedience to the instruction of the God of Israel, it says in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, his belief in the promises of God, putting his trust in what God had said, in what God had promised, putting trust in, in the God of Israel, it says in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. And he believed in the Lord, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So after Abraham trusted in the Lord, trusted in the covenant promises of God, then 
years following him departing Ur of the Chaldees, then the God of Israel instructed him in Genesis chapter 17 that those in his household and strangers who, who sojourned with Abraham in his household, that they were to be physically circumcised at eight days old. And it was a sign of the covenant. A sign of what? A sign that Abraham and those of his household were followers of the covenant. The physical circumcision was a declaration that they are a covenant people and they believed in the God of Israel and they were proclaiming a covenant relationship with him and that they were going to follow and obey that covenant. And so that is what circum physical circumcision represented in the Torah. It was not the physical circumcision by which the one who got physically circumcised came into right standing with the God of Israel. That's what the Torah teaches, and we will be right back after this message. <laughs> 